Welcome to another edition of Drugs, Crime, and Politics, brought to you by the Drug Policy Forum of Texas. Good evening. I'm your host, Buford Terrell. With me tonight, my colleague, Clayton Jones. How are you tonight, Clayton? Real good. That's good. Uh, the last show, two weeks ago, we were talking about uh, the fact that Jerry Epstein, president of the Drug Policy Forum of Texas, and Professor Bill Martin of the Baker Institute at Rice University, were going to make a presentation to the Sugarland Democrats this last weekend. Uh, for our first break tonight, we will have uh, a bit of what went on at that meeting so we can look forward to it. Uh, but the funny thing is, I think the major story tonight is still the same one it was two weeks ago. And two weeks ago, we were talking about the, at that time, brand new report of the Global Commission on Drugs that had just appeared. Uh, the, the report that said that the war on drugs was an utter failure, that the laws need to be changed. Uh, it came out without, apparently, any dissenting members of the commission. The amazing thing is that it's still making news. This weekend, the New York Times read a major op-ed piece by President Jimmy Carter saying, that's what I told you 30 years ago, and it's still true. Uh, many of the major syndicated columnists have written columns in favor of it. Uh, from what I can tell, almost every major metropolitan daily in the United States has written an editorial either supporting it all the way or at least saying it makes a lot of sense. We ought to examine the issue really closely and see what to do. Uh, so far, I've only heard across the whole world two negative comments about the report. One was from the Office of National Drug Control Policy which is required by statute to oppose any attempts to weaken the federal drug laws. And the other was from blowhard Bill Bennett, who was the drug czar under Ronald Reagan and who continues to blow hard on the issue. Uh, what are your thoughts on this, Clayton? Well, you know, I think this report where it's been still out there, it's, it came out June the 2nd, yeah. and it's still in, in the headlines. It, yeah. It's still making lot headlines. Um, I really do believe that's going to be one of the deciding factors that's going to help end this a lot sooner than we were well, hoping. We, we were just looking earlier at... Uh, a story out of the National Conference on Mayors. Yes. Where they uh, endorsed this report and on the basis of it came out with a reg resolution urging Congress to pass uh, Senator Webb's bill calling for a new National Commission on Crimes in the Penal System. So uh, that's, that's developing quite a bit of legs behind it. Yes, it is. Um there's other legislation in our Congress, too, about uh, mm -hmm. the cannabis business, okay. uh, allowing these cannabis businesses to use the banks in California, yeah. uh, which they're having a hard time doing now. And an equality in taxation that uh, they can make their deductions just like any other business. Yeah. Um, well, uh, let, let me go off on this for a little bit. Okay. Uh, and this is why I've been saying that effective reform has to take place at the national level. The Attorney General has said that the federal government 
would not prosecute basically patients who are using marijuana in accordance with state marijuana laws. But even if they're not enforcing the federal criminal laws, we still have problems in that federal safe workplace legislation required on-the-job drug testing, uh, federal education laws require universities and colleges getting federal money to have drug-free campus policies, which means that a medical marijuana patient can, may not have marijuana in his dormitory or use it on campus. We have uh, banks being threatened with charges under money laundering or criminal conspiracy acts if they knowingly allow the proceeds of drug transactions at marijuana dispensaries to go through their banks. We have people being denied public housing because the federal public housing assistance statutes require them to be drug free. So we've got this, this really octopus-like collection of federal laws that are stifling anything that could happen even if the Department of Justice totally refrains from any criminal prosecutions. Well, they're not prosecuting any of the uh, raids they're doing right now. Well, they haven't for about three or four years. They'll go in and they'll conduct a raid. They'll bust up everything. They'll confiscate any money they find. They confiscate and destroy any marijuana they find. They take they any records, computer disk, anything like and that. And they destroy the inside of the dispensary. Yeah, destroy the inside of the dispensary. A real trash and grab raid, but then they never follow through with any criminal charges against anyone. And my sense on that, speaking here as someone that's been a long time watching what courts do, is that the U.S. attorneys know that even if the jury is not allowed to hear the words medical marijuana in the courtroom, that any jury that they pick in the state of California is going to know what's going on enough so that it would be impossible to con get convictions under any of these charges. They're scared to death to take any of them to trial because if juries turn loose, even just a few of these people, it pretty well eliminates any threat that prosecution has now. Right. Richard, was, Richard Lee was here a few weeks ago, and he was saying that uh, they are having a very hard time yeah. getting convictions in California on state levels. Well, that's at the state level, yes. And uh, if, if, if you look at what polls are saying around the country now about what people think about whether or not marijuana should be decriminalized or legalized, especially if medical use should be allowed. Uh, you know, if you just pick 12 people off the street, you ought to have trouble getting 12 of them that would be willing to convict anybody of it. Mm -hmm. It's one thing I keep saying, uh, and I, I said it again the other day when I was in the grocery store and was on that wonderful aisle of crunchy things like pretzels and, and potato chips. Frito-Lay has a whole new brand of different snack foods out with the brand name Munchies. And I've been saying for some time that the people have legalized marijuana, the government just hasn't caught up yet. Look at uh, miracle Grow. Yeah. They are actually trying to target the marijuana industry in this country. Yeah. They're going to come out with a complete new line of um, fertilizers. Okay. And, you know, if we look simply at California and Colorado, 
there's a lot of profit in selling supplies to the growers. Uh, it's, I was going to say, it's a growing business. It is. <laughs> but it's not so happy for our friends south of the border. Uh, Clayton was telling me about, in less than a week's time here in Texas, two great big tanker trucks full of marijuana were stopped and seized. And uh, how many, how much marijuana did 22 you say? tons. 22 tons. Enough to keep Houston in supply for a weekend. <laughs> <laughs> now, the pathetic thing is, it won't make any difference. No, it's not going to really. Mm -hmm. There will be another load coming up right behind it. And when you said that, I thought back to my youth out in the Lubbock area, which politically and legally was as dry as a bone. And I remember once upon a time between Lubbock that was dry and Amarillo that was wet and served as a supply point, they stopped a gasoline tanker truck, arrested it, and this tanker truck, if you got underneath the tank and knew which way to pull and twist on the welding seams, it would open up doors, and I forget how many hundreds of cases of bonded booze would fit inside this tank. But if you got at the top where the, the screw-off caps to go into the tanks are on a regular truck, you could take one of their big measuring rods, dipsticks, that they used to see how much gasoline. You could dip it all the way down, and it would come out dripping gasoline because each of those had been hooked to a pipe going all the way to the bottom of the tank that was full of gasoline. And if people were willing to spend that much money to fix up at least one tanker truck that way, uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't take that much imagination to do it. Well, that's why those two tankers that were, they had, uh, they were carrying gasoline. Mm -hmm. uh, and they could open up the top and see the gasoline, but there was other ways to get to it, and you got into the tank yeah. without... Uh, Although I kind of wonder about why it was even necessary, because uh, the Union Pacific Railroad was complaining this week. Uh, mm -hmm. They're not only the major shipper in the United States, they own a substantial share of stock in the National Ameri uh, Mexican Railroads, and they were complaining about the fines of over a hundred million dollars that had been assessed against them uh, for allowing drugs to be smuggled on their trains. And they were saying, what are you going to do? People lease our cars in Mexico. They load them up. We don't have any way to check them all. We just haul them to where we're told to. And Gee, if some of them contain marijuana, there's just not anything we can do about it. <laughs> but you'll pay the fines. Mm-hmm. And I suspect they made a lot of profit on those fines. Remember, folks, this is your show. Uh, if you have questions or comments, uh, you can call us at the number on the screen, and we'll put you on the air. If you're watching uh, on YouTube, our own streaming video on the web, please email me at the address on the screen. I'll get right back to you, and we may use your questions or comments on the next program. You know, that just keeps reminding me of the same thing. I don't believe the police are really intending to put any in interdiction into the supply of marijuana or other drugs? They go through the motions. Uh, let's see a little bit about what happened when the Drug Policy Forum of Texas visited the Sugar Land Democrats. So let's take our break at this time. In my line of work, I work for PPG, the glass company, the oldest glass company in America. And I'm responsible for developing the territory in Mexico. And I've been working down there now for 10 years. 
And I can tell you in 10 years how I travel to Mexico has changed drastically. Up until about five years ago, I would visit several of our maquiladoras in Matamoros, across from Brownsville, Nuevo Laredo, across from Laredo. I have a good friend in Juarez, across from El Paso. Folks, I haven't been in, in four years now to visit any one of those clients. As a matter of fact, several of these American companies, one of them is a huge door manufacturer, they don't even let their people from the home office go to the plant in Matamoros. The Matamoros workers have to come across and do the business in Brownsville. And, and only, you know, if there's a, an emergency, do they go over to inspect the plant or whatever because of the situation that's happening down in Mexico because of this, this drug war. I spend most of my time in Mexico City, Guadalajara, and Monterey these days. Well, about a year and a half ago, I'm having my coffee here in my home, which is right over here in Sugarland. I'm reading the newspaper, and it's talking about the Holiday Inn Centro Historico in Monterey was attacked. Four people were taken out of their rooms, and I'm reading the newspaper, and I'm saying, that's the hotel that I personally stay at every time I go to Monterey. I'm like, holy cow, what would have happened if I would have been there? They would have said, hey, let's get that gringo. You know? Now, I'm sure the four people they took probably most likely were somehow involved in the drug trade. Y'all, Monterey is the third largest city in Mexico with uh, lots of projects for my company and for me personally to capitalize on with our high-performance glass products that we make here in Texas. It's been a year and a half. I haven't been to Monterey. And, I don't, and my company doesn't want me to go to Monterey. They're okay with Guadalajara, Mexico City, and all down south. Right? And uh, we're, we're actually doing a very nice project in Monterey. And I was about ready to call my engineer to say, you know, we really need to get back to you know, help our customer do some inspection of the equipment. Lo and behold, what do I read in the newspaper yesterday? They're now hanging people on the bridges in Monterey in the downtown area. I'm like, okay, I think I'm going to skip going to Monterey right now. So um, this, this whole drug war situation is, is really just tearing up not only the United States, but it's tearing up the social economic fabric in Mexico. And I see it. Once again, in Monterey, my number one customer two months ago was kidnapped from his office that I visit all the time early in the morning going to work. Four men armed, grabbed him, took him away. The good news is he only spent two days away. I don't even want to know how much it cost that family to get him out. And I can assure you, it was a lot of money. And, it, and, and this gentleman, who is probably in his 60s, is a, a pretty uh, a strong guy and pretty brazen, you know, kind of guy, entrepreneur. Um, he is afraid for his family and basically has moved to San Antonio, Texas to run his business from San Antonio for his business in Monterey. Um, so scared was his family that his 28-year-old son, who quite honestly never um, did a lot of work in the business, all of a sudden he calls me up a couple months ago and says, hey, Darren, you know what, we're going to make an investment in the United States, we need your opinion, where do we go to invest in a glass factory in Texas? Okay. So there's just a lot of insecurity happening down there, affecting Mexicans, Americans like me, in, in the business that we do. Um, you know, there's too many people being killed, we have too many people in our country being locked up for minor possession of drugs, which I, I don't agree with. The money that we are sending over there is going into terrorist hands and drug warlords, and the money's going to bad people. Why, why do we want to be funding people like that? It just, just does not make sense. Now, we as the Sugarland Democrats Club are not going to come out with any position on, on this policy, but I will speak for myself, Darren Patterson. I believe we should start out by at least legalizing marijuana and do a trial with marijuana. And then we can move on and see how that experiment works and, and talk about the other drug. That, that's my personal opinion. And, um, you know, and I know from my own experience that marijuana can go right here in the good old U.S. of A. And we don't have to buy it from Mexico. Okay? We can control it. We can tax it. And we can control it in that way. Okay? I want to make it very clear. I have three young children. Well, 20, 17, and 8. I don't want my children. I don't want your children consuming drugs. I don't. But on the other hand, this drug policy that we have in this country, it's just not working. It's just not working. Good evening. You're watching Drugs, Crime, and Politics on Houston Media Source.
Welcome back to Drugs, Crime, and Politics. I'm Buford Carroll. Uh, that little excerpt you saw was from one of the local Sugarland Democrats who was introducing the speakers at their meeting the other night. Uh, that was his own personal testimony. They did not yet take any kind of organizational meeting on it. Uh, but I think it gives an indication of how at least one American businessman views what's going on down in Mexico. Uh, I know personally my view is that what's happening in Mexico may not be directly under our control. A lot of it is local matters which has deep local roots but if we would quit throwing 30 billion dollars a year on the fire it would burn a whole lot lower and hurt a whole lot fewer people let's legalize drugs cut off the flow of 30 billion a year that pays for the carnage in Mexico. Uh, I have been reviewing a series of books that I've found interesting for some time now. And, you know, most of the time I have been talking about new books. Well, tonight I have one that is an old book by Perry Thomas called Down These Mean Streets. Now, Mr. Thomas was a black-skinned Puerto Rican who was born and grew up in Spanish Harlem in New York. This memoir was published in 1967. This particular edition is a 30th anniversary one issued in 1997, so even it has been around a long time. Uh, he starts out when he was 11 years old and dates it by starting out a month before the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. He was already running the streets and smoking marijuana at that age. Over the next few years, he got strung out on heroin, kicked cold turkey with the help of a friend and the friend's mother, got involved with a gang of armed robbers, shot a policeman in the course of one of the robberies, went away to a New York State prison, stayed in prison for six years, came out, got a job, made a life for himself and became a most articulate writer. Uh, this book is a memoir of his life from age 11 until the time that he got out of prison and settled down to a more normal, straightforward life and then a short afterward written 30 years later. Uh, it's a book that made a big impression on me. It's an articulate cry from the heart. You can feel the pain, the rage, and the determination, all three, that go in here. And I think as important as anything, you can feel the redemption that shows through as well. So uh, this one's a little different from most of the books I've been talking about, but this is one that I would hardly recommend to any of you. It's a fantastic read, and even more than that, uh, it's a fantastic person that I think you will be glad to have met. So read Perry Thomas's Down These Mean Streets, you're in for, I don't say a treat because some of the stuff's a little too rough to call it a treat, but you're, 
in for an enriching adventure, let's put it that way. So, anything else on tap for this week? That well, um, there's just been so much going on all over the country that's been on uh, the news. Uh, police are hijacking people in t Tennessee. They only stop the cars going south because it's got the money. They don't stop them going north because if they get them before they sell it, there's no money involved. That's right. Uh, if they stop the cars in the direction going from Mexico to the northern and northeastern cities, the only thing they can find in the car are drugs, and those drugs have to be confiscated and destroyed, usually burned up. If they stop the cars going away from the cities, carrying money back down to Mexico, either payment of drugs or to buy more drugs, then they forfeit the money under the Continuing Criminal Enterprise Acts. They keep that money and use it to pay for law enforcement expenses not otherwise budgeted. And at least in one Texas jurisdiction, those law enforcement expenses not otherwise budgeted included large barbecue feeds and beer busts for the sheriff's deputies who just really worked too hard too much of the time. Now Clayton, Clayton mentioned this as happening currently in Tennessee. I first heard of it in probably the 1980s, happening on the same interstate in Arkansas. We had a bad session of it here in the 1990s. In Liberty County, just east of Houston, where the story is that deputies would stop drivers if the drivers were carrying <coughs> more money than a policeman would normally have in his pocket, say a hundred bucks or so. They would say it was drug money. They would accuse the driver of being a drug smuggler, but then offer to let him go this time with just a warning if he would sign a release voluntarily allowing them to confiscate the money. So, uh, and it, it also happened back in the 70s and 80s, the heyday of the cocaine world on the interstate between Florida and New York. So, yeah, you've tapped into a, a long-standing source of riches there, Clayton. You know, it's, they don't want to stop the drug war. They don't. They wouldn't be able to have all their stupid uh, task forces and all the money to do all their extra partying, like uh, the convention uh, two weeks ago up in Cape Cod. Oh, I didn't hear oh, about that. Oh, there was a uh, narcotics officers uh, convention in uh, Cape Cod. Okay, let me interrupt just a second. The National Narcotics Officers Association has 65,000 members, roughly. Okay. Now, let's go back to Cape Cod. Okay, well, some of those members went to Cape Cod to go to this convention. And they had a free evening, and they went to, how do you say this nicely, one of these clubs that dance and they take their clothes off? A strip joint. Strip joint? Okay, yeah. I, I call them something else. But <laughs> um, and one of the policemen were... Um, giving one of the dancers a very hard time and the uh, bouncer went over there to tell him to back up yeah. and three of the policemen beat him up. Yeah. Well, some of you may remember and I take the example from fiction because we've all seen it. Uh, you may have watched the TV fictional series Miami Vice where the undercover vice cop drove a Ferrari. Well, that Ferrari in that fictional story was paid for 
with this confiscated drug money we're talking about. Is it fiction or is it real life? I don't know, but there was one real life case recently when a police unit purchased a Dodge Viper with these funds that they used for undercover work. Uh, let's take another break and then we'll come back. <laughs> Those people are not fighting over drugs, they're fighting over money. Drug laws have no basis in science. Drug laws are based on politics and money. So there's this underlying problem that we're talking about. Well, what's the problem? Those who are selling illegal drugs, the uh, drug lords, if you will, and on the other side, the drug warriors. The war on drugs uh, isn't working, and that uh, if anything, it's just making what we call the drug problem a lot worse. Prohibition does not compute. I am an agent for the Universal Common Sense Agency. We have studied your policy concerning marijuana and are perplexed. Let me show you what I mean. In study after study there has been no known overdose deaths from marijuana. And while the cost of human life was zero, the costs in dollars are astronomical. Marijuana prohibition does not compute. Support normal and help stop the reefer madness. To help end marijuana prohibition, go to HoustonNormal.org. We meet on the third Thursday of every month. See you there. Welcome back to Drugs, Crime, and Politics. Uh, I'm Buford Terrell here with Clay Jones tonight. Uh, we've been talking about various things tonight and keep coming back to the report of the Global Commission and the effect that uh, it could possibly have on the status of drug laws, not only here, but around the world. And I think one thing that uh, has surprised a lot of people that don't spend time following the issue is how much change has taken place in the world already. If we look just within the United States, we now have 16 jurisdictions that have passed some kind of medical marijuana law, and I believe it's now up to 15 that have some sort of marijuana decriminalization that uh, allows people to possess small amounts of marijuana without criminal liability. They may still have to pay civil fines, but no criminal record. And around the world, we have Portugal that for several years now has not imposed criminal sanctions on possession of any kind of drugs by individuals. They have been followed recently along that line by Mexico and Brazil. We have uh, Switzerland that has been providing either methadone or heroin, heroin itself in quite a few cases, 
to addicts, providing it to them directly from the government for almost 20 years now. Uh, and the surprising thing that has happened there has been that the amount of drug-related crime has dropped significantly and there have been no heroin-related overdose deaths since they started the program. The Netherlands has started doing something similar, providing heroin to known addicts. And frankly, in the United States, uh, going back to the days of Richard Nixon, of all people, uh, we have clinics across the country that provide methadone, a synthetic opioid, to heroin addicts. Uh, we have them all over the country. Unfortunately, we only have maybe a tenth <coughs> as many as we need. Hello, caller, you're on the air. Buford, uh, Clay, this is Dean. Yes, hey, Dean. Dean. How are you tonight? I'm, I'm good, I'm good. I, uh, I, I, I sense there's something on the breeze these days, uh, change of foot, that sort of thing, don't you? Well, that's yes. what we've been talking about. Uh, I've, I've been calling the Global Commission report the straw that broke the camel's back. Well, it, it's cracking, at least. It yeah. is indeed. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think there's been, you know, on the heels of that, uh, Law Enforcement Against Prohibition had a, a conference last week to, you know, note the passage of 40 years and to recognize yeah. the Global Commission's report. And then the DPA the day before uh, the anniversary had their conference with some congressmen, a governor, you know, some uh, yeah. folks talking about this need for change and to recognize what these highly esteemed individuals were saying in that report. And, uh, you know, it's uh, gosh, hundreds of uh, newspaper articles and TV broadcasts. A lot yeah. of uh, discussion has uh, been coming forward, hasn't it? Yes. You know, the thing that, that has really impressed me, Dean, is that that report's now over two weeks old, and it's still stirring the pot out there. Uh, I had assumed it would be just like any of the many reports we've seen over the years that it hits, we read one day's worth of news story and it goes away, but this one just doesn't quit. No, and I, I, I sense, uh, uh, I don't know, a, a change. I, you know, every month or two, I send letters, uh, emails to the drug czar's office, try to yeah. call them and they'll answer the phone, which, I think they recognize my number. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, the, the the latest round has just been, you know, the yeah. usual, what will you be talking about? Yeah. That sort of thing. But I, I wrote them back the other day. I said, look, it's time to pull the plug on this thing. You're going to wind up looking like a goat. Somebody's going to be a hero for speaking out. Yeah. And I, I think that's the case, isn't it? I, th I think so now. We've always got the old bet about not with a bang, but with a whimper. But I don't, I don't see the drug war just fading away. I think that, that the walls have been so high, high here and have been built so toughly. There are so many people whose whole reputations have been staked on it that I think that the temple is going to come down with a crash and it's going to happen overnight. Uh, and now, someone, uh, some several, are going to be yeah. seen as a herd of goats. That, uh, yeah. Now, whether it's going to happen next month or a year from now, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure how the final break would come, but I think that it's going to be one of those things that when it happens, it'll happen suddenly. Right, right. Yeah, and there are fewer and fewer people um, standing forth or the yeah. need of this drug war? Well, I said earlier that the only person I can think of that has really come out and spoken forcefully against uh, the Global Commission report is Bill Bennett, and we all know where he comes from. He sounded so silly that well, we, we haven't given up on wars against, uh, oh, I, I forget, bad taste or something. Yeah. I forget his phrase, but it you know. <laughs> They, they, they cling to fables and superstition for as long as they can, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, I, was, I was wanting to share with your, your uh, viewers uh, okay. a couple of uh, thoughts. I, I have 
great guests lined up. We're going to be doing some live shows this weekend on the Drug Truth Network. Okay. Uh, Sunday evening, beginning at 6.30, on the uh, Cultural Baggage Show, we're going to have uh, Mr. Zach Dilberto. He's co-author of a book called Hemp. It's actually a novel, kind of like based on a true story, if you will. Okay. Uh, it features Harry J. Anslinger, of course, and some hemp farmers, and just what happens to them uh, over the course of this change in the law. And then I'm still trying to round up, I haven't verified for sure, but I'm trying to get Fernando Grostein Andrade. He's producer of a movie, uh, Break the Taboo. <laughs> Excuse me. And it's, it's uh, a factual. Uh, as someone said, it, it stands in great support of the Global Commission's report because it, it kind of points out the failings of this drug war. Yeah. And, uh, and then on the Century of Life show, we're going to have this uh, gentleman, his name, he goes, he's an artist, goes by the name of Lenny. He produced a, a book about SWAT, I mean a book, a uh, song about SWAT teams kicking in the door. And I was listening to that song this afternoon, watching the video, yeah. Yeah, and, and uh, you, you saw that video, the horrible yeah. uh, uh, shootings and, and just uh, terror, terrorizing yeah. families and shooting dogs and all that. Um, and then, then uh, um, also bringing in a gentleman uh, worked for forfeiture reform. Uh, his first name is Epen. I don't have his last name with me at the moment. And we're going to be talking about, you know, uh, SWAT teams kicking in the door, forfeiting homes, yeah. uh, taking away children, all of that horrible stuff this, this drug war brings about um, if it were doing some sort of good. And again, those, those air on KPFT, which is 90.1 FM, beginning at 6.30 on okay. Sunday. And uh, we've got hundreds of our shows online now at our, on our website, which is drugproof.net. Yeah. Well, I guess you're going to have to start uh, signing off like Charles Osgood did on Sunday morning, and we'll all see you on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> but all right, I'll, I'll use that next time. But uh, you guys keep up the great work, and, and we'll be talking to you. Okay. All righty, Dean. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Well, Dean's not alone anymore. Uh, I saw a notice the other day that in Michigan, some man up there has started a once a week, 30 minute radio show on medical marijuana. Uh, there's a state that adopted a medical marijuana law mm -hmm. two and a half years ago now, and they're still having trouble getting it off the ground. They, they have uh, one a dispensary that is open. It's finally open, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and it's supposed to be a very good place. Well, that's another case of chicken you-know-what local politicians. Mm -hmm. That there was no doubt about the intent of the Vero voters Medical marijuana was in, approved in a statewide referendum. As I recall, it was even with a rather substantial margin in, in that mm -hmm. state. Yes. And two and a half years later, we still find local city councilor, city council and governing boards and zoning boards continuing to pass extensions delaying implementation of the law because they just don't know what to do. We have the same thing even worse in New Jersey. Their medical marijuana law, I believe theirs was from the legislature itself, yes, it was. is now well over two years old. And their governor, Christie, has thrown every wrench into the work he can think of to keep it from being implemented, and there is still no way. Now, Christie has a history. He was a federal prosecutor for years and years and years, and he thinks he's still a federal prosecutor, and he is literally going out of his way to make sure no matter what the people of the state say, no matter what the legislature of the state says, he's going to make sure that no one in that state ever smokes a damn marijuana as long as he's there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. 
And if he wants to protest and call me on that statement, we've got a telephone. We'll be glad to talk to him at <laughs> any time, any place, and put him on the air. <clears throat> He'll find out I can be as big a bully as he is. <laughs> yes, but he's had a lot of professional uh, practice being a prosecutor. Well, I can tell you a secret that I discovered once upon a time when I represented a client at the appellate level in Louisiana. I had been teaching at law school for several years at that point. I was making my argument to the Court of Appeals in that state, and one of the judges on the bench timidly put his hand up and said, Professor, may I ask a question? Yeah, I had him. <laughs> and it's the same thing. I don't care how mean and scary Governor Christie thinks he is as a prosecutor. He's still scared of the law prof. <laughs> and we're going to take another break. In drug war history, June 17, 1971. President Richard Nixon declares war on drugs at a press conference naming drug abuse as public enemy number one in the United States. June 18, 2002. The U.S. Supreme Court rules that in conducting random searches for drugs or weapons on buses, police need not advise passengers that they are free to refuse permission to be searched. June 19, 1812. The United States goes to war with Great Britain after being cut off from 80% of its Russian hemp supply. June 19, 1991. In a secret vote, the Colombian Assembly decides 51 to 13 to ban extradition in a new constitution to take effect on July 5th. The same day, Pablo Escobar surrenders to Colombian police. June 20, 1995. On a Discovery Channel special, The Cronkite Report, The Drug Dilemma, Former CBS News anchorman Walter Cronkite calls the drug war a failure and calls for a bipartisan committee to study alternatives to prohibition. Cronkite concludes, we cannot go into tomorrow with the same formulas that are failing today. June 21, 1995, the Journal of American Medical Association publishes commentary. It is time for physicians to acknowledge more openly that the present Schedule I classification of marijuana is scientifically, legally, and morally wrong. June 22, 2002, the General Assembly of the Unitarian Universalist Association passes its alternative to the War on Drugs Statement of Conscience. This is Steve Nolan for the Drug Truth Network. <laughs> Welcome back to Drugs, Crime, and Politics. Uh, one other thing that uh, has hit the news over the past week, there have been several cases of drug traffic-related corruption involving Border Patrol agents recently. Uh, Representative McCall who fills one of those highly gerrymandered uh, Texas Republican House of Representative districts, the one that stretches from the outskirts of Austin to the outskirts of Houston, is head of a, a Homeland Security subcommittee, and he says that he's going to investigate these uh, cases of Border Patrol security. All I can say is I hope that he investigates them as systemic problems created by the prohibition laws themselves and not simply isolated instances of wrongdoing. If we look just at the Barter Patrol and if we look just at the 40 years of the drug war since Nixon heightened border interception problems, we'll find that it has continually had a very high problematic level of corruption cases. 
the Border Patrol has had far and away more corruption cases on a continuing day-to-day -day basis than virtually any other law enforcement. But it doesn't stop with just the Border Patrol. If we look at the history of the Bureau of Narcotics from the time it was formulated in 1930, we find that in 19, the middle 1930s, the Secretary of the Treasurer had to step in and fire a third of the agents for corruption. Then again in the 1960s, they had to intervene and fire a third of the agents in the New York office, which was over 30% of all of the agents for corruption. And the very next week, fire the head of the Miami office for corruption because he hadn't learned his lesson. And it's not just prohibiting drugs. It goes to any kind of prohibition law. If we go back and look at alcohol prohibition, over a 30%, and this 30% or a third figure keeps showing up time and time and again, but over 30% of all of the federal revenue agents during the whole period of alcohol prohibition were either forced to resign, fired, or convicted of corruption charges. That included the counsel to the head of the agency who was a lawyer and highly connected politically himself. We do know during that time common folk wisdom, which was a little bit exaggerated as it always is, said every policeman in Chicago was on Al Capone's payroll. As I say, that has to be a little bit exaggerated. There is bound to have been at least one honest cop in Chicago. <laughs> When Elliot Ness went into Chicago as an outside treasury agent group to try to clean the mess up, the fact that his guys did not take bribes was so remarkable that they were nicknamed the untouchables. As it turned out, the untouchables weren't untouchable. A couple of them got their fingers dirty as well. In short, if you're going to have prohibition laws, you're going to have corrupt law enforcement. The structure of the game means the same. Now, in some ways, laws against prohibition are prohibition laws, just like laws against alcohol are drugs. There you've got a service that people are willing to buy and sell as opposed to a product, but the law tries to interrupt the market. A recent study of prostitutes in Chicago. Why do I keep coming back to Chicago? But this study in, of prostitutes in Chicago found that over time, 3% of all of their sexual transactions were done for free with Chicago policemen that these were remarkably consistent from girl to girl to girl, and that the women and the cops both viewed it as a business tax to allow them to stay in business. Mm -hmm. So uh, if your representative is Mr. McCall, let him know that this needs to be investigated, not as just one bad apple in the barrel, but as a systemic problem that's going to happen any time you try to enforce prohibition laws. You cannot use the law as a barrier to disrupt something where one side wants it badly, the other side's willing to sell it, and neither one of them sees that they would be injured by the transaction. You know, if we look at real crimes, you don't hear of many murder victims 
going up to their killer and saying, please shoot me, please shoot me, please kill me. You don't hear of many bankers going up to someone and saying, please rob me, I'll give you an extra million dollars if you'll rob me of everything in the vault. You don't hear of that many victims of beatings that go up to a thug and say, beat me up, beat me up. Those crimes actually hurt somebody. It's not the same thing when a customer says, here's $20, give me a bag of that plant. So please tell the congressman to make a difference between prohibition and crime and get his act together. And while we're at it, even if you don't want to write Representative McCall, you've got a representative in Austin, a senator in Austin, a representative in Washington, and two senators in Washington. How long has it been since they've heard from you? Are you sure they really know how you want them to do their job? If you don't think they know that, maybe it's time you told them. It's only your government if you let it know what you want it to do. So. You know, uh, these representatives of ours, oh, got a call? Hello, caller, you're on the air. Uh, yeah. I was wondering if any time soon, within the next, you know, four or five years, is marijuana going to be legal in Texas? Okay. Uh, we sure hell hope so. That's what we're working for. I personally think it, it will, but my tea leaves don't work all that good. Uh, it'll happen faster if you put pressure on your representatives to make it happen. It's something where the voters control the process. The pundits like me just make noise. So pressure your representatives to do what you want done. And sit down and write a letter longhand. Put it in the snail mail. It makes, call. it makes a better impression. Much that better. We've got about a minute, so you need to be quick. Over here. Uh, and I'm just trying to get a clear picture of this. You all are saying legalizing uh, marijuana is a good thing? Yes. yes. Uh, do you feel that that would be downsizing uh, the, the most important thing about not getting drugs in our communities? Okay, now, yeah. let me end there by saying drugs are in your community. Having laws against drugs does not make them unavailable. It just makes them more expensive and more dangerous. Prohibition laws do not stop drug use. They do not even decrease the amount. And we're out of time. So Peace. next week, Please call us a little earlier so we can talk more about this. Keep those cards and letters going to your congressman, and we will be back in two weeks. Thank you and good night. I began to understand that the 17 or the 19-year-old kid I had in the backseat of my police car was not a criminal at all. Remove the profit motive. If you remove the profit motive, you can do away with almost all these problems. And how do you do that? Simple. Damn cooperation, which can only mean one thing. Legalize drugs. Legalize all drugs. If we really want to improve our urban neighborhoods, the most important thing that we could do, the single most important